Thank you, Anya. Yeah, thanks. So, hi everybody. Um, thanks very much for joining, um, and thanks for the introduction, Susie. As mentioned, I'm a publisher working at IOP Publishing, and I'm going to talk to you um, today about how to get your research published. And a lot of what I'll be talking about will apply to researchers across the globe, but also talk specifically about open access publication in the UK. Um, and also, most of what I'll be saying will be useful to those who are new to publishing. Um, but even if you're an experienced author, hopefully there'll be something, uh, some useful tips um, in this presentation. So first off, a quick run through what we'll be talking through today. So um, there'll be a brief, brief overview of IOP publishing um, and some IP journals. Um, we'll look at why to publish at all. Um, we'll focus on choosing your journal, because I think that's a really important element. Um, touch on open access publishing uh, and transformative agreements, um, and particularly in the UK. Um, then focus on writing, um, how to write your paper, and we'll share some top tips on that. Um, and then we'll have a look at the peer review process, because I think there's some, some interesting things in that um, that you, you might be, uh, want to be aware of. Um, and we'll touch on publication ethics and look at what to do after your paper has been accepted and published. So to start off, um, a quick introduction to IP Publishing. So we're a wholly owned subsidiary of the Institute of Physics. So that means that all the money that we make through our publishing activities is then gift aided to the Institute who then use it to promote physics globally and encourage people to study physics. Um, you might be familiar with some of the um, activities that we do. So we um, have 80, over 80 physical science journals. We also have an eBooks program and we also run, um, my colleagues run the Physics World magazine, which is a, um, a world uh, renowned um, physics news platform. Um, did I, oh yeah, we're based in Bristol, uh, although that's our office, but um, obviously we've all been working from home recently, so this has been my office for the last four months, um, and my colleagues have all been in their various home offices as well. Um, we're not only, not only do we have staff in the UK, but we also have staff all over the globe, um, and in a typical year you'd probably see us at conferences um, all, from all over the world really. So I also wanted to mention that I'm, uh, so I'm a publisher that work, um, I work on the materials science portfolio um, at IOP and one of the journals that I work on is uh, Superconductor Science and Technology, which I thought might be of particular interest to this audience. Um, so SUST is a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary journal covering all aspects of superconductor research. This includes materials and basic properties, small scale devices and electronics, wires and tapes, and um, also large-scale applications. It's worth noting that SUST um, has a very high novelty and very high quality standards, and also all papers must show links to experimental work. And that's something I'm gonna discuss um, really and focus on, is, is looking at um, the requirements of a journal and how important that is. So why publish at all? So, Publishing and scientific publishers have an extremely important part to play in science. After all, it's about disseminating um, knowledge and your results. Um, it's an important process in validating your research and it's part of the um, journey of your academic career. It helps you gain wider recognition for your work and contributes to your building your reputation. And publishing in a peer reviewed reputable journal is seen as the universal way um, in which scientists communicate their research. Of course, we have preprint services and the like, um, but the peer review process is really an integral part of validating your research and also gives researchers an indication of what they can believe in. So choosing your journal is one of the most important steps in getting your research published. It's not a decision to take lightly. Um, you have to work with someone you trust and unfortunately, not all publishers can be trusted. You may get a few emails from predatory publishers encouraging you to pay for, to publish. Um, and, as, and as such, I very much recommend doing a bit of research and uh, exploring the publisher and journal that you're interested in beforehand. Um, many considerations uh, will affect your choice, including the scope, uh, reputation um, within your peers, and the speed of publication. 
and peer review. And I'll run through these in a bit more detail. It's important to, it's very important to decide where you want to publish before writing your paper. And I really can't stress this enough as you'll be tailoring your paper and message to your intended audience and the requirements of that journal. And as a, as a publisher, we try and make this process as easy as possible. We have journals covering all aspects of the physical sciences. And we also offer options to meet um, the needs of researchers at different stages of their career. So what should you consider when choosing a journal? Um, it's really important to consider the intended audience of your work. Who would you like to read your work? Um, do your peers read the journal? Is the scope relevant to your work? Um, and it's important to consider if you're going for a niche or a broad scoped journal, as I think this will dictate how you structure your paper and the message that you'll be trying to get across in your paper. So definitely have a look at the editorial board and see if there's anyone on the board that you recognize or any of your peers on the board or are there any big names in the field on that board as these are people that you want to see um, there. And the editorial board will often be consulted um, in the peer review process. So it's important to have a, a think about, um, and have, have, it's definitely worth having a check of, of the editorial board and if there's anyone there that you recognize. Um, it's also worth considering uh, the reputation of the journal, especially within uh, your research community. And impact factor is obviously something that you'll hear a lot about. It's a widely used metric um, which measures the average impact of a journal through the citations that papers receive. And however, it's not the only criteria I think you should look at. Um, it's important to look at the acceptance of uh, likelihood of acceptance. So some journals will have really high rejection rates um, and, and the speed of publication. So how quickly you want to get uh, your paper published. It's also worth considering uh, the publication model. So um, we have open access and subscription models, and I'll talk about that in, in a bit more detail as well. Another thing is um, if there are any costs to publication. So some journals will um, charge for pages uh, and uh, publishing color figures. And there's also article processing charge for publishing in open access. So if you are going to go down the open access route, it's important to think about who's going to fund that, whether that's you or if you're um, if your funder um, will, will provide you funding for, for publishing open access. So uh, think, I also wanted to mention Think, Check and Submit. This is a handy little website which um, has a checklist of basically all these, these things. And um, I definitely recommend having a look there as it could help you navigate the publishing world and avoid things like um, predatory publishers. So a little bit about impact factor, uh, basically, it's a measure of the average number of citations that an article is likely to pick up in the first two years after it's published. And it's not a perfect metric by any means, but it is universally used in the academic publishing um, world. So here's an example of how impact factor is often calculated, is, is calculated. Um, so Journal X publishes 175 articles in the year uh, 2017 and 212 in 2018. Then in 2019, it goes to receive 943 citations to these articles. So the impact factor is calculated by 943, taking the citations and dividing that by the number of articles published. And then you get your impact factor. However, it's also worth considering other metrics such as download levels. These could be a good indicator of how much um, your, how, how, how your article is, um, impact, um, the impact of your article as well. And there are other alternative metrics such as alt metrics. So on the IP um, website, we have this circle with the alt metric circle and gives you information on social media impact such as um, how many people have tweeted about it or if there have been any blog posts or if any news outlets have picked up on, on, on the article. So at IAP we have a huge range of publishing um, of journals and it's important I think to consider the tiering of journals um, when thinking about impact factor. It is worth mentioning that impact factor is not 
a measure of scientific quality, it is a citation measure. Uh, and that means that it can be very field specific. For example, oncology journals uh, and cancer journals tend to have very high impact factors as the work in that field is likely to pick up more citations. While if we take uh, SUST or the New Journal of Physics, uh, which both have an impact factor of three, um, that's actually a very good impact factor for a physics journal. So what I'm saying is that it's important to contextualize impact factor within your research field. So broadly speaking, I think IOP has three tiers of journals. We have a higher tier, such as um, 2D materials is an example of that. Uh, and 2DM has a really high um, quality uh, standard and novelty standard, and it might also have a higher rejection rate. We have mid-tier journals then, such as SUST and the new journal of physics. And we also have our express titles. Um, so materials research express is an example of that. And these express titles tend to have fairly um, lower novelty standards and they focus on um, work that is scientifically correct. So it doesn't have to adhere to a particular impact threshold. So as you can see, there are many venues for publishing your research. And I think it's worth looking um, at the potential impact of your work and thinking about where your article might sit in this tiering system. So it's very important also to consider the publication model, whether that's subscription or open access. So traditionally journals have operated a subscription model, and this is where it's free for the authors to publish, but libraries pay for access to read um, the journal. And authors are generally allowed to self-archive their accepted manuscript in a public repository um, uh, after an embargo period, typically 12 months. And this is often referred to as green open access. So all of IEP's subscription model uh, journals are open access. There's also been an increase in the number of uh, gold open access journals. Um, and we've seen that in IEP as well. We've launched quite a few newer fully open access journals. Um, and gold open access is often referred to as fully open access. Uh, this is where the final published article is made freely available um, uh, upon publication and um, that's subject to payment uh, made by either the author or the author's uh, funding body um, and this is called an article processing charge. Um, and once the paper is published, it's published under a CC BY license which allows reuse openly. So. Many of, um, actually I think all uh, now IOP subscription journals are hybrid, which means that they also allow the option of publishing fully open access as well as in the subscription model. So recently um, there's been an increase in um, transformative agreements or institutional agreements, especially in Europe. And these are between, made between institutions and publishers. Um, and in the UK, we recently signed a uh, open access uh, institutional agreement which en enables universities within the UK to um, for their researchers to publish work on an open back access basis at no additional cost and this is available across all of IOP's um, hybrid journals including SUST um, and there are 56 UK universities signed up to this agreement um, at the end of the presentation I'll share a link to some more information on this, uh, it's definitely worth checking if you're in one of those uh, universities and if you have access to, to this offer. I'd also say that this is uh, not just, this is not just applicable to the UK, we're seeing more and more of these agreements um, happening recently and we have several agreement, agreements in place um, with institutions and, um, and countries across Europe. And it's also worth mentioning that I think open access uh, work is typically more highly cited and downloaded uh, than um, publishing in a subscription model. Um, so I definitely recommend taking up the offer of open access publication if your university is one of um, the ones signed up to this agreement. So a few simple steps to follow um, in order to ensure that you, you, can, you are eligible for uh, for for publishing through one of these agreements. 
So at submission, it's important to ensure that the corresponding or submitting author is affiliated with one of the member institutions. So if your, um, your paper is co-authored or has multi, uh, multiple authors, it's important to select the right corresponding author if you're looking to, to publish open access under one of these agreements. Um, and when you submit your article, clearly state that because it will be automatically um, picked up by one of my colleagues in the peer review team. Um, and at first decision, you'll be notified um, that your, your paper has been automatically opted in to publish open access on the basis of, um, of your institution. Uh, at that stage, you, you may wish if you have the option of opting out if, if you want. Uh, and then upon acceptance, um, my colleagues will validate the article with a dedicated contact at your institution. So you don't have to do anything. Um, and if for any reason the funding is declined, you'll also have uh, the option to uh, publish uh, via the subscription model, if you'd like. So in terms of submission requirements, IOP uh, will try to make this as easy as possible for authors. You can submit in Word, PDF, LaTeX. Um, you can also submit straight, straight from archive, which I think is really handy. You don't have to provide source files if you're writing the LaTeX upfront. These are only required before your article moves into the production um, process. So I think IOP is, is very flexible with formatting. Um, and it's, uh, I'd also highly recommend looking at um, the guidelines on the journal's homepage. We have some really great author guidelines uh, in our, on our publishing support website. Um, and these, this is what the publishing support website looks like. Um, so there's really um, in-depth guidelines here for both authors and reviewers. Um, and the author guidelines will go through the process of writing your article, what we're looking for, and will help you navigate the submission process. We also have an option of tracking your article post-publication, so you can stay up to date throughout the whole process. So on to writing your paper. So before you start, it's really important to assess your results. Are they, are they and look at whether they're novel and important enough to fill a gap in your field of research. Does that line up with, and does that line up with the quality standards um, of the journal that you plan on publishing in? As mentioned uh, before, you will have already taken, have a, uh, you would have already had a look at um, work in um, at the, journal, the journals that are out there, and you will have selected your choice of journal by this stage. Um, it's very important to decide on your key message in your paper and to have a clear narrative so that the readers understand exactly what you've done and why it's important. So first off, I recommend preparing an outline, um, sorting out the structure of your paper. And this is what a typical um, structure may look like. And it's fairly standard, I think, across most journals, but again, I'd recommend looking at you know, the journal uh, guidelines for your specific selected journal. So starting off um, with your title and abstract, um, and then your introduction should really contextualize your results within previously published work. Then you'll have your methodology, and um, this should clearly um, state your method and enable other researchers to be able to reproduce your results. Then you'll have the results, discussion, and conclusion, which will outline what you've done and why it's important. And you can inc also include additional materials such as acknowledgements, references, and figures, and supplementary material if the journal allows. Again, check with the journal if this is something that they permit. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about the title and abstract, um, because I think this is really the most important part of your paper, and it's definitely worth spending a bit of time on. I would highly recommend um, writing the title and abstract at the very end once you've fully written your paper and you want uh, fully understand what results you're going that what are the what results you're going to be um, including in your paper it's the title is the most visible part of your paper it should be concise yet informative and draw the reader's attention it should also be easily discoverable by a google search um, most 
readers now aren't picking up a printed copy of a journal, but they'll be searching for articles in their area of interest um, via online search engines and, um, and journal article aggregators. So it's really important to ensure that you have key terms in your title that can be picked up by those search engines. Um, so here are some do's and don'ts, keep it simple, clear and descriptive, use key terms, um, don't be ambiguous, uh, don't use phrases or jokes as these may not translate um, very easily and uh, don't use acronyms uh, or try not to use acronyms unless they're very much accepted in your community. So the abstract and keywords are also vitally important um, and again make sure you write this at the end. Um, the abstract is really your shop window of the paper. Um, it's also the only part of your paper that will be seen by um, potential referees when they're deciding on whether to review your paper or not, which is not something that's usually considered, but I think is extremely important. You really want to sell your work here. Um, you want to include keywords and phrases, particularly in the first few lines of your abstract. Uh, as search, engines, search engine algorithms give more priority to the beginning of a paper, uh, so pay particular attention to the first few lines. Um, so make sure you include uh, keywords and phrases, uh, be clear about what makes this paper worth reading, summarize your aims and your findings. Um, don't just copy the introduction, uh, the first paragraph from your introduction. Again, don't use jargon, avoid acronyms, um, if you, it, it, unless you really have to, and definitely don't exaggerate or mislead. So on to the introduction and methods. So the introduction is very much about contextualizing your work within previously published research. So most of your references should be linked to the introduction. Um, it's important to cite all relevant work, especially recent work. Again, this will often be picked up in, um, in peer review. So, you, so the re referees will look at your look at your references to be sure that you've, you've done your work in, um, in doing a thorough literature review. The method section should clearly state your methodology and provide as much detail on this as possible. There's a big issue with reproducibility in science at the moment, so you want to enable other researchers to be able to reproduce your work. So give them enough information to allow the duplication of your results. And then the results and discussion, um, and this is, this is where you're going to summarize your findings and really indicate the significance and impact of your work within your field. Um, you want to use the opportunity to compare your results to um, other published work and discuss the implications and potential applications. Um, in your conclusion, you want to summarize your major points and highlight the novelty and significance of your work. It's also important to, to discuss any limitations um, and highlight any plans for future work. You really want to talk about why your work is important and where it might lead to in the future. And then finally, acknowledgements and references. So be sure to recognize all um, contributions from funders and, and co-authors if, if they're not included as a co-author in your acknowledgements. Um, so you want the funding code for this bit, so make sure you have that, that available. Also, it's an opportunity to declare any ethical approval for your work, so if you've worked with animals or stem cells. And then in the references, you want to make sure that you're citing all the right references um, that your work, that are relevant to your work and that your work is building on. Um, be sure to check for accuracy, follow the reference style of your journal of choice, um, and check the guidelines if, if, they, if the journal has a particular reference style. At IEP, we're pretty flexible with um, the reference style, so any, any reference style um, is acceptable as long as it's consistent. It's also incredibly important to think about your figures. Um, and the main thing here is really that they should be self-contained. The figure should be understood by purely looking at the figure and the figure caption. So include key terms and avoid, again, avoid acronyms if possible. And then it's also worth thinking about how the figure might be used post-publication. 
So it might be selected by the journal for a cover if you're lucky, and or it might be used in promotional material. Um, a lot of journals will tweet um, about papers or we use figures on social media to promote um, promote uh, articles or even clusters of articles. Um, so it's important to think about submitting high quality figures, um, thinking about clarity and use colour in your figures to enhance um, to enhance them. So before you submit, I think it's also extremely important to get comments from other people. A second pair of eyes is is um, is is always great and always beneficial, and and they may be able to pick up on things that you missed. And this, in the end, will save you time in um, in the long run, as there'll probably be things that are picked up in the peer review process anyway. So get your supervisor, other colleagues, or even friends to look at the paper. Um, and if you're not a, a fluent English speaker, there are language services out there that can help you as well. So a quick summary um, with some top tips on writing. Check your literature for similar results in the field. Use references to show the context of your work and why it is new and significant. Definitely decide whether you're writing for a specialist or non-specialist audience, as this will um, help you uh, tailor your paper uh, in the right way. And choose which journal you're writing before. Um, choose your journal that, that you want to publish in before writing your paper, and this is really, really key. Um, you also want to spend a lot of time on your title and abstract, as this will be the most. Uh, this will be what people see first, and and potentially judge your work, will potentially judge your work on. You want to keep abbreviations or technical terms to an absolute minimum and definitely define them clearly in their first use. You want to avoid speculation, exaggeration and anecdotes. This will be picked up in peer review if you do um, exaggerate. Keep it clear and concise. Even when there are no word limits, make sure that you try and keep it as concise as possible and use your own words. Some of the best papers and the most highly impact, um, most uh, highest impact papers out there are, have, are very short. Um, well, it's also um, worth thinking about allowing time for rewriting the paper and definitely get feedback from your colleagues before submitting your article. So onto the peer review process. So the peer review is a vital part of publishing. It's a critical filter for millions of research papers written every year. It gives the scientific community and the public a reliable indicator on what to believe on. It also gives uh, authors feedback and can help improve the paper. It helps editors like myself and, and my colleagues decide on what to publish. So here's a quick uh, brief diagram on, on what the peer review process typically looks like. And at IOP, we, um, we have a single blind peer review process on most of our journals. So this means that the referees can see the authors, but the authors can't see who the referees are. So uh, reports are given back to the authors and they're, uh, they're anonymized. So we'll go through these um, steps in a bit more detail now. So in the first instance, we'll go, your, your paper will go through a pre-refereeing stage. And this is basically, um, uh, my colleagues in the peer review team will be checking for um, that the paper fits in with the scope of the journal, they'll look at the quality of the content and any uh, novelty um, threshold standards um, and making sure that those meet with the, uh, with the requirements of that journal. They'll also use a tool called Authenticate to, de to detect any plagiarism or duplication and this also includes self-plagiarism so watch out for that when you're writing your paper. They'll, uh, they may consult the editorial board at this stage if necessary, if they're unsure about a paper. Um, and if the paper is not suitable, it may be rejected outright, or you may be offered a transfer to another journal that might have a better suited scope for you. Otherwise, it will be sent out to referee. So at IAP Publishing, we manage our peer review internally. This means that our, um, my colleagues in the peer review team will use a set of tools to help them identify the right reviewers for your paper. And this is based on a set criteria. They'll look at subject expertise. They'll look at independence. They'll check if, um, 
if they have any, if the referees have any um, relation to your um, to your affiliated institution, they'll check their availability. We keep track of all of our um, reviewers' activities, so we'll know when they last uh, reviewed a paper for us. Um, and we'll also look at their reliability, so we keep a record of previous reviews, and if a reviewer has been giving us poor reviews, we'll, we'll often not invite them again. Um, again, I said, I mentioned before, we have a single blind um, process on most of our journals. However, we also have a double blind option um, on our uh, express titles, um, and this is where both author and referee are, on, are, are anonymized. We're also trialing transparent peer review on a few of our journals. And this is where um, if the author and referee both opt in, the referee reports are published um, online alongside the final article. So you can see how the paper changed throughout the review process. So then comes, once we receive the referee reports, um, typically we're looking for at least two uh, reports um will will make a decision um sometimes uh, an adjudicator might be consulted often a member of the editorial boards if the two referees uh, reports disagree the whole this process um here normally takes about a month or two and referees are asked to rate um the paper on scientific rigor novelty and significance and the decision is made by I, the IP editorial team after reviewing these referee reports. Um, it's worth mentioning that immediate acceptance is very unusual, but it does happen. Um, and at this stage, the referees are often asking authors to make um, certain revisions to their, to their paper. Um, I should also mention that some, some journals have high rejection rates um, you know, some rejection rates are over 50%, especially on higher impact journals, they'll be even higher. Um, so that's worth considering um, and preparing yourself in advance. And being asked to revise uh, your paper is actually a great sign. It means that the referees see merit in your work and that it fits into the scope of the journal um, and they want you to improve your paper. So it's important to read each referee report very carefully, take some time over this, and you want to respond to every uh, comment uh, made. Uh, it's worth keeping a list of your changes and highlighting them in your revised manuscript. And if you disagree with the referees, then clearly ex um, explain why. You, you don't want to ignore a comment. Um, even if you don't understand something, raise that with uh, my colleagues in the peer review team, they'll be able to help you through. Um, and ultimately, this is free advice, so I um, suggest that you make the most of it. So, um, once you've done your revision, the, um, the re your revised manuscript will go back to the, um, most likely the original reviewers, and if they're satisfied with your revisions, then your manuscript will be accepted. Um, or if, they're, if they think you haven't um, revised enough, it might go through another round of reviews or at that point it may be rejected. So everyone has been rejected. Um, anyone who says otherwise, I think is probably fibbing. Um, it's, it's useful to, I mean, the advice here is useful um, and, and is a way to improve your paper. You can always rewrite your paper and submit it to another journal um, and perhaps think about the tiers of the journals again and find a journal that might be more suitable to, to your work. Um, also, if you think the decision is wrong, you'll have an opportunity to submit an appeal and that will typically go to one of the senior editorial board members or the editor in chief um, and they'll have an, uh, another look at the peer review process and see how that was managed for your paper. Uh, and if you do feel that there's something that went wrong, be sure to highlight what you think the issues are in this appeal. On the other hand, if your paper is accepted, um, this is a great, well done, congratulations. Um, and there are a few things you need to do now, uh, which is sign the copyright form, uh, provide any permissions for any third party material included in your paper, 
And also, um, if you're writing in tech, then uh, this is the moment you want to supply your source files. So a bit about publication ethics. Um, this is obviously a big issue and a, and a very serious issue in publishing. Um, there are some, some cases of really high profile retractions of papers, such as the Lancet's retraction of the paper linking the MMR vaccine, uh, claiming to link the MMR vaccine to autism, which had a big impact on, on um, how many people um, vaccinated their children for, for a long period of time. Um, so examples of misconduct, misconduct are plagiarism uh, and falsification uh, of data. As IOP, um, IOP is a member of COPE, which is the Committee for Publication Ethics, uh, and this is a great resource for us, and it provides uh, lots of advice on how to handle misconduct cases. As mentioned before, Authenticate is a tool we use to look at plagiarism, including um, self-plagiarism. So when you publish a paper, the copyright is usually assigned to the publisher. So even if you are um, using a previous work that's yours, you still need to get permission for it because it, the copyright will have been, in most cases, assigned to, to that publisher. So we can't reuse it. Um, we have an ethical policy for our authors as well. And then I'm going to share some top tips on um, publishing ethically. So make sure you're being honest about the claims you're making um, uh, on your results and your conclusions of your research. Uh, make sure you credit all those who have made a significant contribution. If they made a big contribution, then make them a co-author, or um, at least um, if they made a slightly smaller contribution, you may want to mention them in, in your acknowledgements. Um, check the funder's copyright uh, policy. They might have a um, they might have a policy that you uh, must publish your papers open access and they might be able to provide you funding for that as well. You want to disclose any potential conflicts of interest and get permission to reuse anything that you haven't created yourself. And again, respond to all the review reports, even if you don't agree. Uh, don't fabricate, falsify or misrepresent data. Don't submit an article to more than one journal. Um, don't uh, add someone as a co-author without their permission. When, um, if you submit to IP Publishing, all the authors uh, will be notified of the submission, so that might be a bit of a surprise to them if you do. Don't sign any forms on behalf of your co-authors unless you're authorised to do so. Don't copy and paste from other articles, including your own, as this may be classed as plagiarism. And Try not to take criticisms of your work um, from referees as personally, um, as I'm sure this is not how it is intended. So then what to do after your article has been accepted? So your, your accepted manuscript will be available online 24 hours um, after acceptance. And this is in um, IFU Publishing. I know that some other um, publishers have a similar, uh, similar uh, time frame as well. So you want to promote your work uh, to your peers as soon as it is accepted. You can do this um, on social media. You can send uh, them an email. I'm sure they would like to hear about your work. Um, and the accepted manuscript will have a DOI, um, which is the same as the final manuscript. So this is an early opportunity for you, um, you to get your research read and cited. And those citations will carry on through to the final, um, your final manuscript as well. So then a bit about the production um, stage. So after your manuscript has been accepted, it will go to our production team um, and they will format the journal. Um, so they'll typeset the, your paper so that it's in the final journal format. Um, they'll also um, maybe have a look at the English language if there's an issue with that. And they'll also check for any mathematical formulae errors as well. You'll be asked to check the proof carefully. So they'll send you a proof version and you'll be asked to check this very carefully. And I suggest you do this because um, there may have been a possibility of um, introdu um, introducing errors during this process. Um, you can take this opportunity to make some minor corrections, but it's not really um, an opportunity to make major revisions, as a lot of time uh, and resource has been invested to getting your paper to the stage. So you really don't want to be making big changes. Your, um, your corrections will be made. And then finally, the paper will be published online. And this whole process normally takes about one month for, um, for IOP journals. 
Um, you'll then be informed about your paper being uh, published um, online. And if the journal has a print uh, publication, that will follow, usually follow some time later. So what to do post-publication? Um, so there are things that you can do to help increase the visibility of your paper and to um, potentially get more citations. Uh, so as I said, do contact colleagues in your field and uh, I'm sure they'll be delighted to hear about your paper. Use social media. If you haven't got the Twitter account, um, I'd highly recommend getting a uh, professional a Twitter account. There's some um, really tight knit communities uh, in the physical sciences on Twitter. Uh, and it's really worth tapping into that. Uh, if you've got a blog or an institutional home page or an institutional press office, um, it's worth writing to them and, and seeing if they'll, they'll want to do a piece on your, on your article. Um, definitely promote your publication at conferences. I realise that's a bit difficult at the moment, um, but there are alternatives such as this webinar series. Um, this is an excellent opportunity to say more about your research and increase the, um, the impact of your research. There's this handy website called Grow Kudos. It's a free tool um, which also helps you um, with some tips on helping you grow your impact of your research. So um, worth checking out. So as a publisher, we also play a part. Um, so at IEP, we'll promote your article either on an individual basis or as part of a subject collection where our marketing team will do things like email campaigns, um, and we also use our social media Twitter channels, um, whether that's a journals uh, specific uh, channel or we have an IEP materials Twitter as well. And for very high interest papers that will be of interest to um, the general public, we also, or the wider physics community, we also can um, provide some physics world coverage. Uh, so the team might pick up your article and want to do an, uh, um, a piece on it and for um, we also have the option of um, doing a press release for newsworthy papers so we have the press team that do that and an example of this is uh, this article on superconducting wind turbines um, which uh, was the eco swing project the eu eco swing project and there was this, an article in SAS published on this um, last year, which was picked up by a press team and then picked up by um, several different news outlets, had a lot of attention on Twitter and got a pretty good altmetric score. So just to recap, um, I wanted to go through what I've covered in this talk. So we, there was an introduction to IOP publishing and we looked at why to publish, uh, choosing your journal, which is essential to do before writing your paper. Um, the title and abstract in writing your paper are the real key things uh, to focus on. Again, do that at the end of, end of your writing. We covered some top tips uh, for, for writing and getting published. We had a look at the peer review process and um, talked about publication ethics and looked at what you can do post acceptance and post publication to increase the visibility of your work. Um, and just to end on, here is some links to uh, think some of the things I talked about. So I highly recommend checking out our publishing support page, which has those guidelines on um, for both authors and reviewers. Um, we have a, tr a page which details all of the transformative and institutional open access agreements um, that we have. And we also have one specifically for the open access agreement for universities in the UK. So check that out if you're at a UK university and think this could apply to you. And if you're interested in submitting to SUST, uh, I'd also recommend having a look at our um, SUST webpage and having a look at the scope uh, and journal requirements. So that's it from me and I'm happy if we've got time to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Anya. Um, that was a really clear and interesting um, uh, overview of the publishing process and hopefully lots of people have learnt things they didn't know before. Um, before we take questions, I think I noticed that there was some um, comments left on the chat, but it's now disappeared for uh, a while. That's, sorry, that's right. Do you want me to read out the question that was posted? 
Yes, please. Uh, so this was a question from Sankar Ram, who unfortunately uh, doesn't have access to a microphone at the moment. And uh, their question was, uh, what is the level of plagiarism, plagiarism similarity that is generally acceptable? When writing multiple papers for a single project, a lot of the introductions, definitions and terminology is repeated, increasing the level of plagiarism. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the IEP, the editorial team, will really look at this on a case by case basis. So they won't, they'll put the paper through Authenticate and they'll get a, a percentage result out of this, but then they'll go through the paper in detail and look at what what phrases and what parts of the paper there um, have been uh, plagiarized or you know copied from from a different source so there's a bit of kind of sense checking that goes on alongside the use of this kind of automatic tool um, and i would i would say there isn't a particular threshold for this um, but you know if you're using a couple of sentences that's fine if you're um, using i think the thing to be careful of more is, is using whole paragraphs or whole sections from from other papers and that's where that will definitely be picked up on and um and they may ask you then to revise that and that just to reword that into your own into your own words thank you um i think uh, michael parish has a has a question um so john are you going to unmute or shall i oh there we go okay michael Susie, uh, it's not a question, it's more a comment and uh, I'm a member of editorial board for SAST and also uh, an editorial board of IEEE Transactions and Applied Superconductivity and I would like to share uh, my editorial experience uh, just to add points to Anya and thank you, Anya, thank you very much for excellent presentation. Even I learned something that is important. Uh, uh, we will copy this presentation and follow all these uh, do's and don'ts. So, okay, about the editorial process. First and foremost, the peer review is uh, friendly. We want your pa paper to be published. Uh, even when the review is critical, we still want the paper to be published, so help us. And here I want to uh, quote uh, Dave Flaubertier. What Dave told me how we should be looking for paper. Make sure that you answer four critical questions. What, why, how, and most importantly, so. And uh, the, those questions are definitely addressed in Anya's presentation, uh, where I find the most weakness in so, in conclusions. Most authors are trying just to repeat, I calculated, I designed, uh, uh, I did this, my question is, so what, what I should learn from you, that what I want to learn, this material works, this material doesn't work, pay attention to this, pay attention to that. Uh, this is what should be in conclusion. This is what, uh, what I take, uh, take home. Uh, uh, then uh, how the editorial process works. The first question is, is this material within SAS scope? And uh, from my experience, and I edited over 20, in submissions this year alone, uh, many submissions are rejected because they are outside of the SAS scope. So when you submit a paper, it should be about applied superconductivity. If, if you write about cryocoolers, you should explain how your advances in uh, cryocoolers affect superconductivity. It shouldn't be how, uh, is how you design pulse tube or GM cryocooler. It is how, what, what is important for superconductivity. If we cannot find what is related to superconductivity, this is just an analysis of, let's say, dynamic stability of something, uh, we will have to reject this paper if there is no link to, uh, to superconductivity. Anya, I'm explaining about, right? Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, typically in SAST, we don't publish intermediate results. Uh, we, in SAST, uh, what we see, we immediately see what was published on the subject to use it as a using identicate uh, we know that this this is a small addition if this addition is critical uh, guys we found that uh, this approach doesn't work because of quench protection and all we added is quench protection uh, uh, this is good but if it just we calculated this stress okay it's intermediate uh, wait when you when when you calculate more results I suggest to submit this paper to <clears throat> conference issues 
to special issue in Israel or uh, uh, conference series in IOP, but it's not good for uh, for SAS. I think yeah, that's if, it. if I could just add to that, um, I think that's that's um, in if we think about the tiering of the journals that I talked about. So I think the novelty standards for top tier and mid tier journals is often very um, important, and it's the kind of lower tier or in, in our case it's the express titles where um, they don't have um, they don't focus that much on novelty, but we'll just look at the scientific quality. So definitely for SUST, novelty um, um, is very important. Right. Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to contact us. We want to help you. We want uh, more publications. We want higher impact factor. We want progress in our community. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Michael. I think um, Bob Barnes is, is wanting to ask a question. I can see him <laughs> waving his hand. Um, so we'll, we'll go to Bob. Um, thanks very much. First of all, Anita, I thought it was an excellent presentation. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I too learnt a lot. Um, going back, I learnt, uh, I'm talking really on your subject of writing reports. Um, I taught service writing at a military staff college for a couple of years. And I'd like to add um, three points. One is acronyms. Um, in the scientific world, very difficult to not to use acronyms when you use them first time you come to it um write it out in full and then put the acronym in the bracket afterwards yeah. in capitals or whatever you want to put it in um second point is new idea new paragraphs um because you tend to find one idea and run into another in one long convoluted paragraph and the third is use short sentences wherever you can <laughs> full stops are vital <laughs> thank you very much though excellent and um, enjoyed it cheers thank you great points okay um i'm just having a little look down the list does anybody else um have a burning question for anya at this point uh, i should add if you're having if you're having trouble finding the raise hand button you can uh, turn on your video and wave or you could send a message in the chat Okay, I'll, I'll let you keep having a look at that. Anya, before, before you finish, I think it would be really um, interesting for people to um, hear something a bit more about SUST in terms of there being two different kinds of article. In fact, there are a lot, lots of different kinds of article, but there are um, for um, sort of contributed papers, there are two different kinds. Could you just say a few things about the difference between a paper and a letter? Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, although actually, Susie, you might be better placed to do this, but um, so we have standard uh, research papers uh, that are, um, we don't have any, any particular research, uh, sorry, word limit on it, um, but for, for letters, the other, the other kind of type of research paper we have are letters, and these are aimed at really higher impact results that are going to be important and key and make a significant contribution to, to the research community um, and will get a bit more attention um, and typically there we want them to be shorter um, they'll go through a faster per, um, uh, peer review and, and um, publication process so they'll get to the um, they'll get published quicker as as we recognize that they're um, of higher impact and and require that special treatment but it's um, one of the things that uh, were key for these papers is that they should be shorter and um, and not uh, as wordy or not as thorough, uh, not as not, not thorough, but um, not as um, as uh, extensive as a standard research paper. I don't know, Susie, if you, Susie, if you want to add anything to that, as you probably have a lot more okay. experience as being the letters editor. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I would encourage people, if you're if you're interested in send, um, submitting your paper as a letter, um, is that it's really important to. Uh, send a cover letter that justifies why you think this is a letter. Why does it fit the criteria um, for a SUST letter, which are um, more substantial developments, new developments in the, in the results, um, and also why it justifies um, faster peer review. Um, so what's the timeliness in the, in the work? Why, why does it justify going through this faster process? Um, 
that really helps when it comes to comes to me most of these things come to me when they're first submitted as letters um, to, to work out whether they should go through the standard peer review process or whether there is something new and exciting particularly exciting um, about this work that means that it qualifies to be to be reviewed as a letter um, it also helps if you give a, a, a an idea of your word count um, so that we can make sure that it is about the right length for a letter um, which I think the guidelines are about four and a half thousand words, if I remember rightly, yeah. um, for a letter. Um, so it helps to have that word count so that we can make sure that, that, it's, that it's of the right um, length um, for that. Okay, are there any other, any other people who have questions at this point? Um, I don't think so, Susie, I've not seen any. Okay, um, so I'm going to um, thank Anya again very much for her for her presentation today um, and it will it has been recorded so it should be made available quite quite soon by John I'm sure that he will announce uh, the website when it's when it's there um, so that you can go and, and look at it and, and disseminate that to colleagues if you think they'll be interested if they've not been able to make it um, I also um, sent out an email to the, the mailing list earlier today um, with the names of the people who are presenting over the next few weeks um, next week we've got um, Pablo Cayado from KIT and Andrew May from Daresbury Laboratory in the UK um, talking. Um, and I'd like to mention also that on the 23rd of July our talks are going to be earlier um, than usual, so they'll be at 12 o'clock UK time. Um, and the reason for that is that there's a, a magnetic society, a UK magnetic society half day workshop in the afternoon um, on uh, high temperature superconductors for engineering aircraft. So we didn't want to clash clash with that. So we're moving our talks um, earlier that day. Sorry, uh, Susie, uh, Chiara yeah. Tarantini would like to ask a question if we've got time. Uh, yep, yeah, I think we have, yep. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, so Chiara. So I'll just unmute Chiara. Um, so no, it's a comment, not, not a question. Um, so uh, as... As a, a, a reviewer, I found frequently um, there are many authors who tend to mix the result with the discussion. So uh, I encourage everyone to keep these two sections separate. Uh, I learned uh, my, when I was young that is not a good idea and, and I see it now be a problem in uh, several papers. So it's better to keep the result separate because they are fact, they should not be uh, um, they, they should not be objectable, let's say, and uh, and keep the discussion at the uh, toward the end of the paper and separate for the result. So you can uh, uh, in the discussion you can develop better your tools and connect better uh, result obtained obtained by different part of uh, your uh, uh, your experiments. Thank you very much, Kikio. It's a very good point um, that, that I think sometimes does get lost in, in papers. Thank you very much. All right, unless there are other questions at this point, um, we, shall, we shall leave it there. And I look forward to seeing you um, next week for the, for the two talks um, by uh, Pablo from KIT and Andrew May from Daresbury. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us this afternoon.